On today's episode, I sit down with Logan Allen, the managing general partner and founder of Finn, a VC firm that now has 10 unicorn portfolio companies, some of which have IPO'd, and over $1 billion in assets under management. In this episode, we discuss B2B SaaS tailwinds that have occurred from the pandemic, best metrics for tracking SaaS companies, the opportunity ahead for financial information migrating to the cloud, Logan's take on SoFi's stock performance since he was previously a VP there and is also an investor, challenges ahead for the fintech space. There's been a lot of volatility as of late. Logan's strategic advice for fintech founders as they plan for 2022 and a whole lot more. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find someone more intimately knowledgeable on the fintech space, especially the B2B side, than Logan, and he provides incredible insights here. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Here's my conversation with Logan Allen. Logan Allen, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ray. Appreciate you having me. It's fun to talk with uh, venture guys because you know not a lot of people may know this, but a lot of billionaire types invest their money with folks like you. They're looking for diversification. And, and a lot of people think of Warren Buffett, who's just buying companies or investing in stocks, but that's not how all billionaires operate. And a lot of times they're looking to place their money in lots of different nooks and crannies, including the venture world. And I'm, so I'm, I'm eager to talk to you about your experience. But before we do that, I understand that you are a big fan of chess. And one underlying theme I also find with billionaires and especially investors is this passion for games. It's a it's a common framework to apply game-like probabilities to investing. So games like poker, bridge, and blackjack are often favorites. And less often, but still common, you find billionaires with a passion for games like chess. So I want to know what lessons from chess you've learned that you've been able to apply to your investing practice. Yeah, I know. It's great to be here. And, and I've been a big chess fan. Uh, I'll call myself a chess nerd since uh, high school. And my dad taught me uh, chess when I was in grade school. But I was captain and founder of the Duke chess team in undergrad and ended up building out Duke's chess team and helping the university provide consideration for chess, which I'm really excited about. But the lessons from that are one, a growth mindset. I've studied Dweck, as as I think a lot of your listeners have, and Dweck always talks about a growth versus a fixed mindset. And in chess, there is just habitual learning, particularly with the advent of computers and that becoming more and more prominent as I continued to play, which is you need to continue to study openings, you need to continue to study your middle game, and basically look for and review master competition games from all around the world. And that drove me to understanding that you can really learn and dive into any subject and learn it and study it and grow significantly and your knowledge base around it. Number two is pattern recognition. So in chess, you see patterns emerging in terms of positions and how things evolve. That definitely applies to venture capital, where you have your gut instinct or your pattern recognition in terms of investing in a company, monitoring a company and its growth trajectory, monitoring a situation where there might be a a board question or an issue with a founder or the like. And there's a lot of pattern around that and things that have happened before that uh, you can take into consideration. So those two absolutely map, in my view, to games generally, but particularly chess, which is a growth mindset and this idea of pattern recognition. That last point to me raises this question around sizing people up. You hear about Warren Buffett's ability to, to walk into a room, meet someone for the first time and like within a handshake, kind of know if there's going to be a deal or not, just sizing people up. And I'm remembering you know, the Queen's Gambit where you sit down across from your competitor and you're, you're kind of getting that first initial feel for people. Is there something there that you feel is a skill you've, you've learned just from reading people? I think so. And it also applies to poker. I play poker occasionally as well. And I think sizing people up and reading the person is is a huge part of chess as well, particularly in blitz, which is accelerated chess. So typically, you only have five minutes per person or 10 minutes total to make all your moves. In those situations, you can read a lot about the person. You can also read about how they open, much like a founder opens up a meeting. And so I think there's a lot to say about founder judgment and, and evaluating founders. We as a firm, for example, only invest in repeat entrepreneurs, preferably repeat founders. Um, We do not invest in first-time entrepreneurs. We'll invest in first-time CEOs, but we will not invest in first-time entrepreneurs. And so our profile is very much somebody who's been in a startup environment, been in an entrepreneurial environment, walked thousands of miles in those shoes, and now is starting their a new company um, or possibly their next company. Um, And that's been an evaluation of the data 
um, but also in, in sizing people up. If this is your first entrepreneurial gig, there's been fairly binary outcomes in those regards. Is the fact that they've maybe failed in their prior business of concern to you? I know in Silicon Valley that you hear all the time that they almost praise failure and it's, it's looked upon in a very different light. Is that something that matters to you if, as far as the previous company was successful or not? We prefer, obviously, to see success and, and the right trajectory. We have a top 50 fintechs that we track on. We use a platform called Lighthouse, uh, lighthouse.ai, which we leverage to source companies and source founders. And we run an algorithm on that vis-a-vis founder DNA. And prior entrepreneurial experience is absolutely part of that. And part of the scoring is whether the prior company succeeded or not. But they still get credit for having that entrepreneurial experience. And so they pass that at least threshold in, in terms of our minds and in, in the sense that they have the founder DNA to start something new. They've, they've learned those lessons and so forth. For example, I know we're going to chat a little bit about the company Pipe, um, which you'll hear a lot about from Jason Calacanis and and Shamath and others. Pipe is one of their favorite topics as well. We led the seed in March of 2020. And the prior exit from the founders, as they are one to admit, was was not that exciting. They sold their, their first business to FAIR, but it was what they learned as part of selling that business and afterwards in terms of the gaps they saw in the market that helped them uh, come up with a business idea for Pipe and then execute against that. So Um, You can absolutely rise from failure as well. And and that's uh, an important outcome. Um, But as it relates to our kind of criteria, we would have certainly have preferred, you know, you knowing what success looks like to be able to, you know, better replicate that in, in your new venture. So Logan, what sparked your passion specifically for investing, having come out of the banking world initially? And what was the appeal of venture capital? So I started my career in management consulting, and I fell into it, as I've uh, publicly commented on in the past. I did an internship at Citigroup in my junior year at Duke. And coming out of Duke, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And so I decided to go into consulting, which is largely what everybody does when they're not sure exactly what they want to do, because it provides this really interesting breadth and depth of opportunity sets. And they looked at my resume as I was going into Capgemini, and they said, oh, he did an internship at Citigroup. He must be an expert in financial services. Let's put him in the financial services group. And so that's literally how I got into fintech. From there, I fell in love with the space. And that was because it plays such a massive foundational role in the markets as it relates to running of banks, running of asset management, insurers, hedge funds, private equity firms, and so forth. There's a technology layer and enablement aspect to all of those businesses. I ultimately went from consulting into the industry side, working at City National Bank, focusing on digitization and customer experience in that platform. And then I went and did the same job, but more with a global purview at Invesco. Um, before I got this very strong entrepreneurial itch and went back to Silicon Valley, I, w- I went to high school in the Valley. And a lot of my friends, while I was running around in a suit, were running around in hoodies and flip-flops and, and visiting with them in my role at Invesco, where I was actively looking for innovation opportunities uh, and partnerships in the Valley. I decided to leave Invesco and join SoFi as an early team member. And that really changed my trajectory. And from there, I really saw what was happening in both the entrepreneurial ecosystem and company building, um, but also in the VCs that were providing them capital. And in looking at venture capital, what I saw was a portfolio approach to working with entrepreneurs. And I had been taking a portfolio approach in my consulting life to working with a a number of large institutional enterprises. And so it it felt familiar to me. Uh, And then secondly, um, I started to really gravitate in my early days uh, after SoFi towards enterprise, back towards enterprise software. Um, which is where I had focused initially in my consulting career and recognized that instead of licensing that technology and implementing it, I could be investing in it. And that felt like a dream job to me. And so I got great advice from a number of VCs, guys like Roloff at Sequoia, guys like Brian Sigerman at Founders Fund. And they all said, you need to go keep operating. And so I did that for a number of years. And it was great advice. And I always tell people who are at investment banks in consulting or at business school that they should be getting operating experience before they go into venture capital. And that's fundamental to that pattern recognition comment I made, having credibility sitting across from an entrepreneur that you're looking to invest in, frankly, being able to add operating value beyond capital as you work with that entrepreneur. And so for me, I think this is the greatest job in the world. 
being able to leave an impact on a, on, and a legacy on a massive industry, um, be able to work with entrepreneurs to help them execute on their visions every day. And I don't feel like I should be getting paid for what I do. So that is a, a very good sign. So you've been running Finn now for over three years. And I'm sure those are very interesting years having gone through the environment we're all in. But you now have 10 unicorns in the portfolio and over a billion dollars now in assets under management. With incredible numbers like that, I'm assuming, and I could be mistaken, that there were some tailwinds perhaps and perhaps related to the pandemic. But was that the case? And if so, what were the tailwinds? I would say COVID, for all of the unfortunate repercussions and everything we all live through, did serve as a tailwind and a digitization catalyst. And I think you know this is pretty well uh, trodden territory uh, at this point from a data perspective. Um, but you know we couldn't go into bank branches, people couldn't go into call centers, and the customers that our companies serve those being banks, asset managers, insurers, I'll call them the larger fintechs uh, like PayPal, Intuit, and so forth. And then corporates, both retailers and big tech, they recognized that whether they were already financial services businesses and they needed to vertically integrate digital capabilities on an accelerated basis, or they were corporates that were trying to vertically integrate financial services and maintain their digital distribution models, they needed to move really quickly. And so, you know, people have talked about six years of digital movement taking place in six months. I'm not sure what the order of magnitude is, but it happened quickly and certainly more quickly than we all expected. And so we had massive tailwinds in our portfolio as a result of that. Our investment box um, entails that we, we are investing full life cycle from pre seed through to taking public uh, companies public out of our SPACs. But we solely focus on B2B SaaS. These are capital light businesses, no balance sheet, no credit risk, typically not regulated or lightly regulated, and just very capital efficient, high gross margin businesses, um, which thankfully were fairly insulated in COVID and are fairly insulated from inflation, um, rate environments, and then supply chains. And so we sat back and looked as our portfolios had some of their best years and months uh, on record. And so felt very humbled and fortunate by that. And now we're in a place where, you know, Omicron obviously fully being short uh, and accelerated here, you know, we're going to see some return to normalization. But I think that digital adoption curve and that rate uh, of adoption is, is still here to stay. Now, I imagine when you're focused on an industry such as fintech, you are looking to build an ecosystem, so to speak. So with every company you're kind of looking at, you're like, okay, that space hasn't been explored yet, but it works over here nicely with this company. Do you find a lot of synergies interacting between the portfolio companies? And if so, could you give us an example of that? Absolutely. So we uh, have a very top-down thesis orientation to where we think the white space exists in fintech. Again, within that Venn diagram of B2B SaaS, and we have identified six subsectors today that are on our website. We're very public about where we're constructive that we think represent the largest areas of white space and then very specific theses within those. And so what we do is we go out and proactively market, um, market map companies back to those subsectors and those theses and look to select one category winner within those. Um, what that results in is no overlap in companies. We don't want conflicts in the portfolio, but a significant amount of potential synergy in portfolio companies working together. And so just in short on those six subsectors, we are the most excited about embedded finance, the CFO tech stack or anything that touches the treasury function, asset management and capital markets, insure tech, blockchain from an enterprise application perspective, And then lastly, what we call infrastructure and enabling technologies, that's things like regulatory technology, big data analytics, this massive cloud migration uh, problem, leveraging quantum computing, et cetera. So those six subsectors are where we focus proactively in going out and sourcing. And that's really where we pointed Lighthouse from a data science perspective on a bottoms up basis. And so just as an example on the portfolio, we have a company called Natomi. They are a customer success Mm -hmm. platform driving omni-channel customer automation through email, which shockingly is still about 80% of customer service traffic, a text message, social, 
agent assisted and what that allows companies to do and publicly you know they have customers like Brex and New Bank and others where they're supporting that customer service automation it improves customer success improves the customer experience eliminates call center reliance pretty significantly, which was a massive problem in COVID. So as you can imagine, across our portfolio, anybody who is touching consumers, but increasingly anybody who's touching SMBs or SMEs, they need triaging support and the ability to have customer self-serve and, and be supported on a, on a timely basis. So there's a lot of overlap to, with Natomi. And then secondly, our portfolio company is Sinterra, which is a banking as a service company. Sinterra sits in between banks, uh, the fintechs and corporates, all of whom need banking infrastructure, compliance, and then fintech applications, they're helping serve as that middleman or that glue between all those areas. As you can imagine, they are able to partner across our portfolio as well and enabling those capabilities. So we love connecting our portfolio companies. We built a community around Lighthouse, around the events and programming we do across what we call the Fin family. And that's been uh, really fundamental. And uh, the stat that we're the most proud of um, that speaks to this is that we have a 95% net promoter score across our portfolio. And we've been between a 90 to 95% since inception, and we're now at 70 portfolio companies. So that's the biggest litmus test and number I look at to make sure that we're scaling appropriately and in the right way, that we're actually adding value beyond the, the, the capital we're investing. Very cool. You mentioned migration to the cloud. And I've heard you mention that only 10% of quote unquote financial information is currently stored on the cloud. So what does that mean? And walk us through the potential opportunity that this is speaking to. So Gartner puts out a uh, survey every year where they look at uh, budgets in terms of how much the banks are spending. Financial institutions in 2022 will spend, let's call it roughly $1.25 trillion on technology. That sounds like a big number because it is. They're the number one spenders on technology in the world beyond any government or other industry. And then they put out kind of the lead table around uh, cloud adoption. And they are consistently in dead last around cloud adoption. So what is the disconnect? They're the largest spenders on technology dead last in cloud adoption, um, which means, by the way, they're licensed enterprise SaaS, which is cloud native or multi-tenant. And the industry calls this a massive lift and shift problem. So how do I take data and functionality out of legacy mainframe technology that's probably on-premise? And how do I shift that into public clouds, private clouds, multi-tenant clouds, whatever the structure might be, which lowers the cost of ownership dramatically, allows you far more scale allows you to tap into more functionality and all the other benefits of the cloud. Um, It is actually not a legal issue. It is not a regulatory issue. It is not a privacy issue. The OCC actually does not care where your data exists if you're a bank. Um, They just want to make sure that it is appropriately risk managed, compliant, cyber secure, etc. And I can tell you that a AWS or a Google cloud or an Azure cloud is far more secure than having a server farm in the middle of the Midwest. <laughs> and so it's amazing that this transition has not taken, taken place on a more rapid basis. And it is principally because of the legacy mainframe technology and how difficult it is from a technical problem perspective to abstract that data, that functionality, and actually migrate to the cloud. These projects typically entail a hundreds and hundreds of Accenture and or IBM consultants. Literally, it's abstracting this data using... Um, effectively flat file formats, and then you know trying to figure out how to parse it together, putting it in places like data lakes and so forth before they migrated ultimately to the cloud. So it is a massive uh, industry issue, uh, and I think will continue to be. Um, and then I think you know the second piece is is mainly internal policy, uh, and a lot of CTOs at large banks very much still have the mindset that they should be building everything. And I always tell bank CTOs when I have the opportunity to sit down with them, and many of them are LPs of ours, that they shouldn't be building anything. There is an API and a solution third party for everything out there who is spending all of their time, money, and effort on that very specific piece of IP and R&D. And that is not your core competency. Focus on the customer experience, whether that's retail or commercial customers. Own that. Make it incredible. Make sure it's, it's stitched all together in a very seamless way. 
don't focus on building the middleware or the back office or any of that functionality. So I think you're slowly starting to see that adoption. JP Morgan announced that they're taking their entire core banking system and moving it into the cloud with Thought Machine, which is a UK-based company. That's an incredible milestone. And going back to the Gartner research coming full circle, Gartner also shows you a breakdown percentage of spend uh, by the banks. Percentage of spend on internal applications versus third party. 2022 will be the very first year where third party spend will eclipse internal spend. So there's hope. (laughs) Wow. Now, is that just a means of the, the big banks trying to stay relevant, so to speak? I mean, they're trying to stay innovative, but you know, they don't miss, maybe have the R&D centers in-house to do so. They're, so they're outsourcing this more and more? Correct. Uh, the banks are uh, absolutely competing with the neobanks, and they're also competing with the robo-advisors and any of these other players that are focused on the consumer or the SMB. And those players have presented effectively a, a less friction, better customer experience um, with ease of use, more transparency, and branding and positioning that says, hey, we're on your side. I obviously spent a lot of my career at SoFi um, going to millennials. We have a portfolio company called Greenlight that has targeted families and very specifically Gen Zers as part of that family finance offering. And they're winning customers and winning share. And so the banks look at that and they say, okay, we've got these fintechs nipping at our heels. And I say that very specifically because on a total asset basis, it's still you know, a fly on an elephant. And they take a long view and they recognize they need to innovate and do so quickly. And then they also look at net interest income, which is their primary revenue driver. And that has been basically zilch for many, many years, thanks to the Fed's policies. And they look at OPEX. So a big part of this is, yes, keeping up with the neobanks. But the bigger part of this is the OPEX concerns and the weight that that has on their bottom line and recognizing that they need to skinny that down and reduce the the amount of IT professionals they have and the amount of warehouse keeping the lights on costs they have in their IT budgets. Now, as a VC, are you penciling this out to a certain strategic when you're looking at an investment? For example, I work in beverage and so it's very common that you hear, okay, does Coke or Pepsi want to buy this, for example? Because you know those are the two major strategics in this industry. With fintech, are you basically looking at JP Morgan, et cetera, when you're going down and say, okay, who, whose portfolio is this company going to fit into? Will they be interested if we just execute on X, Y, and Z? We are from a commercialization and distribution partnership perspective, but we're not from an exit perspective. So the most likely uh, exit outcomes for our portfolio are IPOs or SPACs. Um, or strategic exits. And the number of strategic acquirers for B2B fintech is actually much larger than it is for B2C, B2S, and B-oriented business models. So that includes the the legacy or old school fintechs, as I call them, uh, FIS, Pfizer, PayPal, Intuit, uh, Square, right? So they're all being hugely acquisitive. PayPal has a budget of $5 billion per year uh, per Dan Schulman that he's looking to spend on making acquisitions. You, would, you can put Visa and MasterCard in that category as well, who have also been hugely acquisitive. Secondly, you increasingly have big tech, Salesforce, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, all have made acquisitions within the fintech and Web3 space, spaces in the last several years and will continue to do so. Uh, third, um, you do have, I'll call it the exchanges and the fund admins, groups like SSNC, NASDAQ, etc. have been hugely acquisitive in the space. And then you have asset managers and insurers. And then lastly, you may have the banks. Um, the challenge for the banks in acquiring a B2B SaaS business is they become the sole customer uh, to that company and the revenue uh, opportunity becomes less interesting. Um, and so you know, our companies very much try to stay Switzerland when they look for a strategic exit to maximize the TAM and the opportunity set that they have to go after. And if they only work with one customer, and then that's not a hugely interesting outcome over time. And so that's how we think about the exit profiles. But from a commercialization distribution perspective, we have strategic LPs in the asset management world, in the insurance world, in the bank world, and in the wealth management world. So we're absolutely looking at that matchmaking opportunity as we uh, evaluate businesses uh, from a pipeline perspective. Let's cover the appeal of B2B SaaS specifically. I've heard you mention that SaaS pricing is broken and that SaaS revenue recognition is broken. So talk to us a little bit about what you mean there and the opportunity. 
Sure. Uh, so the number one issue that we find in call it seed series A companies as they go to market is their pricing model is almost inevitably broken. And we look at average contract values or ACVs as a SaaS investor. You want to see ACVs over 100K in, in a kind of a top decile type SaaS company, generally 200, 250K plus. Um, and in early days, our companies are mispricing or pricing their uh, IP and their offerings way too low. And then they're getting stuck at that ACV. So they're you know pricing it somewhere in the 25 to 50K ACV range. And then when they go to rene- renegotiate, it's usually problematic. They have MFN clauses in their contracts, creates long-term, long-term issues. And so we've built uh, pricing models and best practices in our operating playbook, which we uh, share with our portfolio companies. Um, So that's one big part of the issue. The other big part of the issue is calling vanity metrics and SaaS. Um, So we all uh, remember the WeWork example in terms of adjusted EBITDA and all these games that are being played. Well, the same thing's happening in the SaaS world. Um, so my favorite is contracted ARR. Well, what what does that mean? So it's 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 in the bank. Well, no, it's not in the bank. It's it's something where the contract is is almost done. Okay, it's almost done. It's not signed. <laughs> it's in your pipeline. So uh, pipeline revenue versus bookings, meaning the contract is signed and the revenue hasn't hit your bank account yet versus realized ARR versus gross revenue versus net revenue. There are so many areas of of gap earnings that get misconstrued in the SaaS world that it's comical. And so we'll get these investor pitch decks where they're talking about, you know, uh, 50 million of ARR, and then you dig into the numbers, and, and it's absolutely nowhere close to 50 million. And so I, I think, you know, the more has to be done around guidance in this space, certainly FASB and, and others have provided, um, you know, some v- views on how they define all these things. So we actually have a Microsoft document um, that we send out in PDF or Microsoft Word to our, all of our finance teams and our CFOs that says, this is how this is calculated. This is what the definition is. This is what you should be reporting, nothing else. Because if you're reporting anything else, it's definitely, it's, it's probably non gap already. But if you go into non gap t- territory, the amount of wiggle room that's provided today is pretty massive. We want our companies to be representing themselves in the right way because sophisticated investors are going to dig into the PL and the balance sheet ultimately and, and figure it out. So I do think this is an emerging problem. And frankly, now you're seeing the public market pullback around a number of fintech companies and SaaS companies. And people are starting to, to ask questions about how sticky is this revenue? One of my favorite metrics that I like to use in the SaaS world is net dollar retention. So that is how much revenue you're making from a customer today, and then how much additional revenue uh, you got out of them over a period of time. Um, so the top 10%, and this is actually the number one indicator of enterprise value in a SaaS company or their multiple, I should say. Um, and the quality of that multiple and the sustainability of that multiple is net dollar retention. And 120% plus is the um, kind of uh, top 5% decile, top decile returns for from a SaaS benchmarking perspective. And so we look at that very carefully. And that comes down to, okay, the, the customer loves your product so much, they've actually added usage if it's on a usage basis or added seats if it's on a seat basis. And they're finding so much value, they're rolling it out across the rest of the company. That means they're going to be stickier. That 120%, the next year turns into you know 100% uh, revenue. Uh, and, and then you start over again. And you got to continue to deepen that relationship, which is where customer success really comes into play. Um, so we could spend all day on SaaS metrics, but you know we talk to our companies all the time about this. And we really try to be prescriptive with how they should be thinking about it. No, I, I find it fascinating. And for those listening who are like, okay, this isn't relevant for me. I only invest in public companies. I'm not, you know, I have enough money to put into venture, et cetera. I just want to highlight um, something you said earlier, which is a lot of your companies are the exit is IPO, mainly once you start getting that unicorn status. I mean, you're over a billion dollars. I mean, it, acquisitions become tougher and tougher and the universe gets smaller. So IPO is maybe the most common path from that point. But also some of your companies, especially the one you worked at previously, SoFi, is public and, and there are others uh, maybe even going public soon. So I want to talk a little bit about SoFi, given that you have more than intimate knowledge just having worked there. What's your take on SoFi as a company? I just want to highlight also that it went public in 2020 and billionaires such as Bill Miller, Chamath, and Dan Loeb have been holding the stock, although I believe Bill has sold 
and Shamath has recently reduced, but that could be because or why, I don't know the correlation causation here, but the stock has been highly volatile with three near 50% corrections in the last year alone. So for investors listening, how does A, the company make money and B, what is your take on today's valuation based on maybe the metrics you mentioned earlier? Good question. And we have four to six IPOs conservatively uh, this year, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, those coming out of our growth portfolio and then our SPAC, which uh, we listed in October of last year. It trades under XFIN. And we're out in the market uh, having discussions around that SPAC today. And we will be serial SPAC sponsors. And SoFi was really uh, the first major fintech company to go the SPAC route. They decided to go to the SPAC route, and this was what they positioned publicly because of the quality of the sponsor and Hedo Sophia and Social Capital, which Chamath is at the helm of. And we think very highly of both parties. And we felt like with SoFi's consumer orientation, they would be great partners and, and help take the company into the public markets and support them with both growth capital, um, as well as obviously the advantages of being a public company, particularly with a balance sheet and lowering cost of capital, being able to recruit more, increasing their brand value, and so forth. Um, And so we were very supportive of the timing of of the IPO and that trajectory. But as you said, the stock has traded in a highly volatile way. I would say that's the case in the last, uh, you know, call it two to three months for the entire fintech space. And what you've seen is that the fintechs that have had the most volatility are consumer-oriented, highly regulated, have interest rate sensitivity, may have some inflationary uh, sensitivity as well if they're touching the consumer and the consumer basket. And, uh, you know, I've had in some cases um, some pretty significant issues with regulators, uh, a la Robinhood, Coinbase, and so forth. And in SoFi's case, they took a very interesting approach to bolstering their business model in advance of going public by acquiring Galileo. Galileo is a B2B software platform that help companies issue debit and credit cards um, and is a banking as a service platform. Hey, I am so excited about this sponsor that we have. The name of the company is Fold. They have a Visa debit card and here's the card right here. I use this thing literally every single day. Um, Every time I swipe it, I get at least 1% back in, in rewards and the rewards are in Bitcoin. And um, some of the rewards go as high as 100%. There's even a full Bitcoin that you can win. After you swipe the card, you spin this little wheel on their app and then it produces the uh, reward. But the lowest uh, reward you'll get is a 1% uh, reward. The thing I really like about this card is um, you can also on their app buy uh, gift cards. And so Amazon is one of the partners that they have. And you can go out and buy an Amazon gift card and you get 5% back when you use this card. And so like all your Christmas shopping or whatever it might be that you're doing on Amazon, you're getting 5% back. It's all paid to you in Bitcoin rewards. You can withdraw those Bitcoin rewards to a self-custody wallet, whatever you want to do with it. There's no gimmicks. There's nothing that you're not seeing up front. Um, It's just an amazing uh, company, an amazing platform. And every single swipe, I'm getting Bitcoin. So I love it. Um, If you want to sign up for this thing, and I'm telling you, this thing is this thing is a no brainer. Uh, go to foldapp.com slash TIP. That's foldapp.com slash TIP. You'll get 20% off uh, their spin plus annual fee uh, when you sign up uh, with that link. So go to foldapp.com slash TIP. So that was SoFi's ecosystem play and not only vertically integrating their own tech stack to be able to leverage Galileo, but also leveraging Galileo's capabilities in servicing the rest of the fintech market with players that include Chime and Robinhood. Um, So I think that was a brilliant uh, acquisition. It looked expensive at the time, um, but based on Galileo's growth rate rate and their contribution margin to the overall SoFi enterprise, I think it has been a big part of reducing volatility in the name. Our view also is that SoFi has been hit by the extension in the CARES Act. So Biden came out and said, you know, uh, earlier last year, he said, we're going to extend the CARES Act through the first part of Q1. Uh, he then updated that uh, in December to say we're going to uh, accelerate, uh, we're going to continue that through March. And the CARES Act aspect of this is, is simply consideration for student loans um, and allowing people to uh, effectively get their student loans uh, uh, written off. And a big part of SoFi's business is student loan refinancing. Ergo, 
um, less loans in play to potentially refi. Public markets view that fairly negatively. Um, but you know, it's traded down to twelve, thirteen dollars today, which is an all-time low for the stock after post back. And I would say that you know, interest rate concerns is is absolutely a big part of that. Um, but that's hit the overall Nasdaq, and I think will continue to be a, a headwind. So I don't think you're going to see any relief in all these fintech names until earnings uh, here in mid February. And I think Q4 earnings, you know, should be fairly attractive for names like SoFi and others. But it's going to take several strong earnings showings from SoFi and others in order for them to get out of this uh, the cycle. Unfortunately, I want to double click on that because the SaaS Capital Index has doubled from a low of 8.1 times ARR in March of 2020 to now a high of you know, almost 17x by the end of last year. So this is uh, obviously an extreme boost in valuation. I- I'm kind of curious, you mentioned sort of this sensitivity to interest rates and starting in the public markets. I'm wondering if you see this potentially trickling down into the private markets where the multiples we're seeing on, on these highly valued SaaS companies could take you know, a hit as well. What's your take on the market and possibly being overheated by these metrics? So I, I think on the, on the SaaS side, you've seen less multiple compression than you have in the consumer and SMB-oriented spaces. And I'm speaking more about this intersection of fintech, obviously. And I think that's because public market investors look at a consumer business or an SMB business. They see a balance sheet, they see credit risk, they see regulatory issues, and they think tangible book value, right? Versus in a SaaS company where there's true IP, ARR, some level of, of churn assumptions, typically you know sub 10% for the top decile, 120% plus net dollar retentions for the highest quality names. And they get more comfortable that that revenue into the future is sustainable and real, um, regardless of growth rate. Um, and there's a gross margin that's, that's helping protect that um, at you know, 70, 80%. Um, versus consumer and SMB oriented names, where those gross margins tend to be in the 20 to 30% plus range. And so that's why I think you've seen flight to quality in SaaS, and that will continue. And so we're, and, and frankly, there's more insulation if you think about the three big, I'll call it four big macro issues right now impact of COVID and new strains, impact of I- interest rate hikes, and, and obviously uh, the Fed starting to taper sooner than expected. Third is uh, inflationary pressures uh, and cost of inputs and impact on the consumer basket. And then uh, fourth is supply chain issues, right? So those four issues effectively, depending on obviously who the SaaS company is selling into. So like a Coupa, for example, is going to be a little bit more sensitive to that supply chain issue because they're selling into companies that may have complex supply chains. Uh, Trade shift in our portfolio has a similar type business model. And so you have to look at, obviously, to the end customers, but writ large, those four areas aren't as big of a concern for SaaS companies as they are for the broader market. So that's why I think you've seen less compression. So my, my favorite example on this multiple story is, is DocuSign. Um, they were trading at 100x trailing sales at the end of October. 100x. That's a crazy multiple on, on any dimension. And as we all saw, they got really hit hard uh, through year end. Well, they bottomed out at 15 times trailing sales, which is still a significantly healthy multiple. And so again, I think you're going to see more insulation in the SaaS names, less of a, a hit on, on their multiples, less of a hit on EV as a consequence. And they're going to be the first to really bounce back as hopefully we get some recovery here in Q1, Q2. But to your point, that has and always will have a knock-on effect to pre-IPO rounds. I think pre-IPO rounds, SPACs are certainly giving significant forward revenue credit. And the terminal value equation that we all do is happening on you know next year's forward revenue or multiple years out. And that will continue. But your discount rates going to absolutely change. And, and that's going to have some multiple compression in these pre-IPO rounds. But this, the flight to quality the insulation, et cetera, that I've spoken to are all still going to be there for SaaS-oriented businesses. So I'm curious, in this environment, even if it is somewhat uh, insulated, as you mentioned, how would you advise fintech startup founders in today's climate? Meaning, are we in a growth at all costs type of environment and full speed ahead? Or are we kind of batting down the hatches and getting profitable climate? 
I think we, you know, we saw this in Q1 of 2020. Um, Sequoia came out and said, batten down the hatches, index to profitability, uh, trim OPEX, raise as much capital as you possibly can, uh, increase your debt lines, right? So those, those five things were the big pieces of advice from Sequoia and, and many of us in Q1 of 2020 uh, under a great degree of uncertainty. I think in Q1 of this year, you're starting to see some of those same recommendations coming back. Um, I don't think we're in anywhere near as bad of a climate as we were in Q1 of 2020. And I think the hopefully Omicron, uh, just you know, looking at the data coming out of South Africa, is, 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 a, is a bit overblown in terms of the potential longer term impact. And, and we'll get through that uh, quickly. But I think the uncertainty around other strains and this being something we're going to have to live with into perpetuity, good news is, uh, you know, for the biomedical field is coming out now with pill forms on being able to take in more antibodies. And I think there'll continue to be innovation around that, which is great. Um, and so I, I think that first issue I raised in terms of COVID uncertainty will dissipate. But those founders that have in the fintech world, and many of them do, balance sheet, credit, interest rate concerns, and or impact from an inflation or supply chain perspective, need to consider uh, uh, edging and moving more towards profitability, reducing, ratcheting down growth, uh, improving gross margins, doing all the things to make sure that they're they're insulated. And I think you're going to see down rounds, flat rounds, increasing venture debt, Etc. And certain types of business models um, for certain SaaS companies, particularly those that have had headwinds from adoption perspective that we spoke about earlier, they're going to be able to take advantage and continue to accelerate their growth and invest while others are fearful. Uh, classic uh, Buffett recommendation. And so there's going to be a very strong have-nots uh, and haves kind of de- type of divisiveness in in the market as a result, and it's going to really depend on where you are in the space as to how you're allocating dollars and whether you're out raising capital. Now, there is a significant amount of capital on the sidelines. If you're able to take in capital without taking on you know, massive dilution, um, it's absolutely something we're recommending to our companies so that they have optionality uh, and the ability to in- continue investing in growth, continue hiring the best people, uh, and to probably lengthen the period of time between fundraising rounds so they can hit uh, more meaningful milestones that have to be absolutely solid before they hit their next series. Um, so I think you know all of those things are top of mind for us at the, at the board levels in these companies and, and certainly the case for CEOs out there. So in an effort to take on more capital with less dilution, as you put it, you know, you're talking about higher and higher valuations. And, and that has some pitfalls as well, I think, for a founder. And everyone needs to understand that when you're raising and setting the bar really high valuation-wise, trying to you, you have to live up to that at some point. At least your investors do. They're looking to double, triple their money off of that valuation. So talk to us a little bit about the risks of raising at those levels of valuations, especially when you're getting up into the billions. Absolutely. And there's been quite a bit of, I would say, articles and, and thoughts written, I think rightly so, that venture capital dollars can be a dangerous drug. And so if you're a CEO and you're continuing to take on more and more capital, particularly in quick succession, without really having the metrics to support uh, those rounds, and there are very specific benchmarks that we lay out for our companies through our operating playbook for seed all the way through to pre-IPO. I think public market investors and research providers have done an awesome job on SaaS metrics for pre-IPO companies and public companies. They haven't really provided much data uh, down from there from from a a, a company timeline perspective. And so we've tried to fill that gap in in providing data out. Happy to share that out with with anybody that's interested in in seeing those. And uh, those valuations in these, you said there's a lot of round preemption going on now, particularly around the Series B where growth equity investors are coming down market and saying, hey, this is a company I would have invested in the Series C probably two to three years from now. I'm going to invest in them today, even though they don't have the metrics I would traditionally look for, they're going to get there because they're on that trajectory. And I want my ownership now and I want to have ball control. So that is a massive trend line that's, that's obviously been occurring for the last several years. We're seeing it more and more, particularly around our Series B companies. Um, and I think it's a trend that's here to stay as more crossover investors who were in the public markets went to late stage and are now moving down from growth equity into expansion stage and into early stage. And so it's really important that CEOs understand you're taking a valuation on that you need to be able to grow into and grow into quickly. Otherwise, you're going to put yourself in a position 
uh, where that investor who is really happy with you and excited to give you the capital at that early point, they don't see uh, your forecast uh, uh, be recognized. Uh, you're going to suffer the consequences in terms of either a down round or a flat round, which is going to accrue to more dilution for those founders. Um, and I think that is one of the biggest dangers right now in venture capital is what I call channel stepping. So these funds, Andreessen just raised $9 billion. You're seeing fund sizes increase, more products out there. That has resulted in those investors needing to invest the most amount of dollars they possibly can in the most attractive companies from their perspective. And in some cases, the founders don't want those dollars uh, or they don't want as big of a round, um, but they're being forced to take that capital vis-a-vis the term sheets. And as a result, valuations have gone up. And that works until it doesn't, to your point. Uh, and I think for us, and we really try to be thoughtful about the step function that uh, our companies are taking, um, particularly in that Series A, B, C, as the companies uh, uh, scale through those rounds. And then I do think pre-IPO rounds will start to contract uh, from a size and, and multiple perspective as a knock-on effect from the public rounds. And in many cases, um, we're seeing pre-IPO companies uh, not decide to take on a pre-IPO round, given those dilution dynamics, given the kicking the can down the road on the IPO timing, but rather just decide to go the SPAC route. And that's our bet, having launched uh, uh, our initial SPAC and planning to be serial sponsors, is that SPACs are not practically uh, uh, a, a, um, a different route or an alternative to a traditional IPO path, but rather an alternative to a pre-IPO round where you don't take on that dilutive capital, you get public uh, more quickly, the benefits of that, and you still get certainty around how much growth capital you're going to be able to raise to put to work on the growth side without leaving any money on the table. Um, And so we think that's going to be an interesting dynamic for higher quality sponsors going forward. Let's talk about Andreessen really quick. They're now managing something like 20 to 25 billion, I think. I mean, at that size, they're a behemoth now. And is there possibility for them themselves to go public? And do you think that'll be a a trend as these VC firms grow? And me, yourself included, you're growing fast over a billion and and TPG and some others are are doing something similar. Is that going to be a trend we continue to see? I think you you look at Sequoia and their asset base uh, and certainly others like Andreessen that have obviously grown assets under management really dramatically. I think the challenge for asset management businesses is they don't tend to trade well in public markets. You're certainly seeing that trend from going from a, an exempt reporting entity uh, under, under the venture capital rules to an RIA. I don't know that you'll see a ton of venture firms deciding to go public, mainly because, again, they, they don't tend to trade very well uh, on an asset basis. Their enterprise value is right around 10% of their AUM. Right, so if you're valued at 10% of AUM um, and you have pretty thin margins, uh, it's a it's a tough, uh, I would say, outcome for the founders versus staying private, being able to leverage either exempt reporting laws or the RIA laws to execute on the investment strategy that you want to support your founders, provide value as a fiduciary to your LPs. Public market listing could be a pretty significant distraction and. I don't think uh, a a very interesting outcome ultimately, uh, just in terms of how those businesses are getting valued. Um, But you know, we have a lot of respect for the generalist VCs and what they built. Uh, We work very closely with uh, a number of the generalist VCs across our portfolio. I think for us, we've uh, chosen to be uh, stage disciplined and size disciplined, and that's why we have four separate. Uh, fund strategies across our four verticals from pre-seed to early stage to growth to late. And we could plan to continue to do that. And at the end of the day, you look at the quantitative data around venture returns. If you go above 400 million in size in a venture strategy, you get massive drag on performance. And that's Kauffman Foundation data. Cambridge Associates has, has looked at this. Um, everybody's pretty much decided that you shouldn't raise a venture fund that's more than 400 million because that will be a detriment just purely from uh, from fund math and the historical return math. And yet, everybody's still doing it, right? And Andreessen raised a $500 million seed fund, as did Greylock. And so I, I'm not sure you know, how they're thinking about deploying that and, and allocating it. 
Uh, there's some really smart people around the table at those firms. But for us, we look at that historical math, we look at the portfolio construction, and then we look at bandwidth in terms of serving our companies and obviously being good fiduciaries to LPs and wanting to make them a 3x net, which is obviously all of our hurdles. And it becomes a, a much more difficult problem versus you know separating all these funds out and having fund cycles that you know are on a measured basis so that you continue to show progress. Now, you mentioned you've created a SPAC, and there's, I think, now over 500 SPACs. But when you point out the amount of unicorns that are at play, like CB Insights reported that there's almost 960 unicorns at the moment. I mean, that's a, that's a decent pool of opportunity to go public. Is that the thesis? Is that kind of the metric you look at and say, okay, there's a lot of opportunity. That's why we want to get into the, the SPAC game, or there's, is there another reason? Well, we think SPACs are a structure that are here to stay that the flight to quality will be in PEVC sponsors, where this is a natural extension of what we do every day. And third, there is going to be a massive amount of runoff in the SPAC market this year. You've already started to see uh, a lot of it. And many of the SPACs that have taken fintech companies public, Money Lion and others being great examples, are now trading at way below their par value. I think Dave is, is a good example of something that went public last week. And you know, these are companies that were probably not ready to go public. They are, they tend to be consumer oriented businesses, which as we've talked about, have not been favored by financial investors, just given uh, the, the makeup of those businesses from a metric perspective. And that's been, you know, really bad signal to the, the market overall. And then you've had lower quality sponsors, retired executives, politicians, celebrities, and athletes going out and raising SPACs just because they wanted to raise a SPAC and not having the platform or the capabilities to really execute on that. And so our view is that for us, um, we have a dedicated team. That's all they do every single day is focus on our SPACs. Um, We only have one in the market today. We plan to only have one in the market uh, on an annualized basis. And that gives us the ability uh, to really focus on our own portfolio companies first and foremost, uh, supporting our growth equity companies that might view a SPAC as an alternative to a pre-IPO round. Or we're thinking about going public the traditional IPO path, but would rather work with us as a sponsor because we'll be their quarterback into the public markets versus working with an underwriter where they may not have a very strong relationship with those underwriters. And um, they've also seen the IPO pop effect and potentially leaving money on the table. And that is obviously a huge concern for them. And so we plan to execute this first spec this year and you know continue to sponsor them uh, as it merits because we think it's a, a superior structure to a traditional IPO path. We think it's certainly a superior structure to a dilutive pre-IPO financing. And if you're solely focused on the enterprise SaaS space, and you see those high quality unicorns that are able to sustain those and grow those valuations in the public markets, then that can be a really positive outcome. We also don't view it as an exit event. Um, It is simply a stepping stone into the public markets. Uh, It almost is like the clock resets uh, from our perspective, because we may be already invested in the private markets and then help take the company public. And then we stay on the board and really support that company into its next phase of growth, taking them from an enterprise value of maybe a billion dollars to five to 10 billion. What does that journey look like? So for the CEO, that's really strong messaging because we may have been with that CEO since the very beginning in the seed stage. And if we can support them now into the public markets, they have a trusted uh, partner uh, that will support them into that journey. And for our LPs, Anybody who wants to sell in the, in the private markets uh, through secondary certainly can. Uh, if they want to transfer their position to a public market holder, they can do that as well. But for us, we don't want to be sellers if the company is going to continue to compound uh, extremely well and start to generate free cash flow and be a long-term success story. Why would we sell that position? Um, so I think the SPAC allows for that full life cycle continuity uh, and is a huge benefit to the investor base and the company and the ecosystem. That's interesting. So, you know, speaking of selling, Chamath, who I know is in on some of your deals, or similar like Pipe and some others, they're expressing a little bit more bearishness. I think Chamath was saying he had sold out of all but one of his pipes, and he greatly liquidated um, going into November, October, similar to when Elon was selling a lot of Tesla and some others. I'm not getting the same sense from you as far as any kind of outlook or bearish outlook. 
And I'm kind of curious if, if, if you think, you know, if you look at it like a cycle and you think if we're late in this stage or, or still kind of fairly early or somewhere in between. I, d- I definitely think we are in a period of caution. Um, but as an enterprise software investor, I would rather be playing my hand uh, today than, uh, you know, uh, people who have been heavily investing in consumer and are overexposed to consumer. And Chamath's SPACs were all heavily invested in consumer, certainly uh, one with Virgin Galactic, uh, less or so, but um, certainly long tail consumer in, in, in that case. And so, you know, he chose to go down the consumer route. And that was obviously where his bread butter was from his, his Facebook career and, and writ large. And that's great. He felt like you could add value and have ball control there. For us, our differentiation, our ability to have pattern recognition and to underwrite businesses is very much in this enterprise SaaS space and the intersection of fintech where we have an edge. And so where we feel like we have an edge and can get comfortable on a long-term view of a business, um, we're very happy to, to take that long-term position from the early stages all the way through to taking the, the company public and holding on to that position in, into perpetuity. And so you know, very much like you know, Warren Buffett and others, um, having that long view, understanding the compounding effect of those dollars uh, and ultimately dividends and so forth. That's a much better position from my perspective to be in. Uh, In terms of outlook, bearish versus bullish, I mean, I think we're short-term bearish and have been really since uh, Q4 of last year, uh, given the the Fed speak and everything else we were seeing from the markets in terms of inflation, in terms of supply chain, in terms of the Omicron emergence and so forth. But uh, I think that second half of this year going into next year, for fintech stocks in particular, you're going to see meaningful recovery as you get more certainty around the interest rate uh, picture. Hopefully, you get some uh, uh, some more clarity around how we're going to handle Omicron and future variants, uh, and you get more certainty around the inflation picture and, and the supply chain picture. Uh, for us, again, you know we're fairly insulated from those four factors um, and, and continue to be very constructive on this acceleration of digitization trend that you know took hold in 2020, and we think will will continue to be the story and headline going forward for fintech and adjacent. Logan, this has been fantastic. Before I let you go, I want to give you an opportunity to hand off to our audience any resources you feel like you want to share. It could be related to Finn. It could just be general investment advice. What would you like to leave for our audience before you go? Sure. Uh, On the venture capital world, only have one book recommendation, uh, Brad Feld's Venture Deals. He's on volume four. It's the only book that when anybody asks me how they should learn about venture capital, that's number one. Number two is Paul Graham's uh, blog. That blog is probably 20 years old at this point in some cases, not the age of Paul, but that is a, an awesome resource um, for any founder that's, that's looking to learn more about building a company. Uh, and he obviously built YC, which continues to be a prolific producer of companies. So those two, two resources I would absolutely point to. And then we really try as a firm to put out thought leadership. And you can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And then our website, finbc.co slash news. We really try to put out content, looking to be open about what we're seeing in the markets and be transparent uh, with our own IP because we think it will benefit the broader fintech ecosystem and community. Fantastic. Well, Logan, really appreciate this and all your time today and really enjoyed the discussion. I hope we can do it again soon. Thank you, Trey. I appreciate the time. This is awesome. All right, everybody, that's all we had for you this week. If you want to see if any billionaires you love are invested in any of these fintech companies, you can go to the investorspodcast.com and check out the TIP finance tool. We really love your feedback. So if you get a chance, hit me up on Twitter at Trey Lockerbie and be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app. And with that, we'll see you again next time. Thank you for listening to TIP. Make sure to subscribe to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network and learn how to achieve financial independence. To access our show notes, transcripts, or courses, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 